in concert with a dessert fellowship to follow. So if you can come back tonight, bring some guests, bring a dessert. The concert will be at 6 o'clock, and then we'll go into the fellowship hall and just have some time together. That's 6 o'clock tonight. On uh, Tuesday night is the Mother's Day banquet. Now, that's not just a mother-daughter banquet. That's a mother-son banquet, too. That's for moms and kids. That's Tuesday night, May the 3rd at 6, right here in the Fellowship Hall. Everything is provided, and everyone is welcome. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, and we'll have the breakfast, a full breakfast at 8.30 in the morning out here in the Fellowship Hall, and then no evening activities. Good to see you all. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this day. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for each person that's laid aside some time to come together and worship you in spirit and truth. Pray, Lord Jesus, that you just as we move into this month of May and all the activities of school and moving into the summertime and everything like that, Lord, that you'd help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and help us to walk with you and to follow you and to serve you and to be open and available for whatever you've got to do in our lives, Lord Jesus. We just thank you so much for the salvation that we have through you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. If you would stand and take a hymnal, turn to number 493. We will sing the first verse and then move around and make everyone welcome. 493.
and Children's Church will dismiss, dismiss you at this time. <coughs> Let's turn to 217. a request from my son Talon. It's his favorite one. Number 571. <coughs> 571.
Now let's turn to 325 and on the last verse with the ushers, come. 325.
Well, amen. Thank you, ladies. Vicki, your left foot got to work out on that song, I'll tell you what. You're pumping that, you're pumping that organ, girl. Great job, Marilyn. Great job, Vicki. Appreciate you all so much. We've been looking at some of the stories Jesus told. Jesus stories, parables, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And this morning we have one in Luke chapter 12. The Bible records about 40 or so of these stories that Jesus told. There may have been more that didn't get recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But this was his main and major method for teaching, the idea of story. Jesus knew as a great communicator, the easiest way to get anybody's attention is just to say, once upon a time. And everybody listens. So he used stories a lot. We said parables are an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And when we look at these parables, we always see God, and we often see ourselves, and we sometimes see areas of life that need adjusted. And this parable today would be definitely one of those areas that may need some adjustment in our lives. Now, there's always a context or a backdrop to these parables, and in this one, it starts in verse 13 and 14. He actually tells this story in response to a selfish demand or a selfish request. You see there in Luke 12, 13, one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? So there was a little sibling rivalry going on in the crowd. One of the brothers thought Jesus could settle the dispute since he was the Messiah and all that business, a rabbi. And, of course, any time kids are expecting an inheritance, it can bring out the best in some and the beast in others. And I've experienced that in working with families. It's always sad to see families after mom dies or dad dies squabbling about this and, and fussing about that. But it does happen, and it was happening in this situation here. Oh, by the way, you heard that Prince Rogers Nelson died. Prince. Then he became the artist formerly known as Prince Then he became prince, so whoever he was, he had no will. And so he was married twice, but had no children of his own. So now here's these boo coodles of millions of dollars in song royalties and properties and handlings. And they got the half brothers and sisters because his parents were married more than once. He had half siblings and step siblings. It'd be very interesting to see how all that plays out. He died without a will. And so I would encourage you, this isn't about making a will, but it is about the future, uh, to do that if you haven't done that. Sherry and I did that when we turned 50. And three years later, had no idea that she was going to pass away like she did, but I was so thankful because we had everything all laid out. And I knew what she wanted, and and, and so everything worked out well that way. Uh, By preparing a will or by making your wishes known, you save a scene like verse 13, <laughs> where, where brothers and sisters are squabbling and choking. They may not like the way mama said to do it or daddy said to do it, but at least you told them how you wanted it done. So there was this, uh, this selfish request, this selfish demand. I want my money. Help, help him give me. And Jesus gives a solemn warning on the basis of that. He said, take heed, verse 15, Beware of covetousness. Now, some versions, some new versions say greed. I don't like those versions. I like covetousness because none of us would ever admit to being greedy. I'm not greedy. So, he's not talking about greed. Covetousness is like the the root from which greed is the fruit. I'll say more about that in a minute. But he says, watch out for covetousness. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Or I would paraphrase verse 15 this way. Jesus said, watch out, life is not stuff. Life is not stuff. Covetousness, what he's talking about there in verse. It's such a subtle, but such a powerful sin. Very few people ever repent of covetousness because very few people ever recognize covetousness. In over 30 years in the ministry, I don't think anybody ever said, Brother Rob, pray for me. I'm a coveter. (laughs) But it's number 10 in the Ten Commandments. It doesn't say, Thou shalt not be greedy. 
It says, thou shalt not covet. Sort of an underground sin, sort of a beneath the surface sort of thing. But twice in the New Testament, Ephesians 5, 5, Colossians 3, 5, it's called idolatry. Coveting is idolatry. And so Jesus says here to these two guys having this squabble about stuff, watch out, your life is not stuff. Coveting is a very American sin. It's a, a, a sin that was just made for our capitalistic, consumeristic culture. You know, we have the American dream thing. And what's wrong with trying to better yourself? What's wrong with a better job? What's wrong with a newer car? What's wrong with another house? Nothing, in theory. But we have to be careful because covetousness can sneak in. I mean, in America, we're encouraged to covet. Advertising, marketing, why do you think they spend millions of dollars on those Super Bowl commercials? They, they, they stir something up and, and make you believe you need something you hadn't even thought about. I mean, I didn't know I stunk until I saw the Arid Extra Dry commercial. I, I, I didn't know Toyotas was so good until they went over that cliff, you know, and, 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 and survived. You know, you see these commercials. It's like, what, what is that? And there's infomercials. Wyatt loves infomercials. He's six. And he lo- if he hears one of these infomercials, the other night I was watching Marty Stewart show, and they had this commercial come on about this uh, flex seal in a can. And, and they take this boat, and they shoot it full of holes. And then they take this uh, screen door, and they lay it over all the holes. And they take and they spray the flex stuff all over the screen door, and then he goes up in the, and why is he standing there? His eyeballs big, bugging out, his mouth open. He turns around and says, Paul, we need some of that. <laughs> That's what they do. And I, he never thought about flex seal in his life. He's six years old, for crying out loud. But the commercial, we got to get some of that. And he's like that all the time. And that's what those commercials do. They, they, they stir up something in us that causes us to want the next new thing. I thought my 50-inch TV was fine until I saw the 60-inch. What's up with that? <laughs> no, I, I thought cell phone number six was good until it came out with number seven. You know what I'm saying? Cars, clothes, uh, phones, the next new thing, the update, the upgrade. That's the way it is. So Jesus says in verse 15, watch out. For covetousness. I mean, we even got a shopping channel. You can go on your TV and just shop till you drop. Well, you already drop, but shop while you sit. And you think about the success of eBay, Amazon, all of these things that are not bad in and of themselves can take us places where God never intended for us to go. Amen. Jesus said, watch out, verse 15, your life is not stuck. I was in the hardware store the other day. I was buying some stuff. Because <laughs> we need stuff, but our life is not stuff. The fella came around the corner there, and he hadn't seen me for a while, and so he began to strike up a conversation. About the same time, a gal came up around the corner there, and she saw me and mentioned my name, and I was right in between them. And I said to her, oh, you're back from Florida. She said, yeah. And he says, oh, do you go to Florida? And she says, yeah. He says, so do I. And she says, well, where do you go in Florida? And he told her, so well, we go down there too. Do you know where such and such is? Yeah. And they began to have this discussion about where they were, where they parked, how much money they spent, how big their boat was, how they needed a new place. Next, And they forgot I was even there. I was like, <laughs> and then they both said bye and walked off. And, and I forgot what I came for. But, but I was thinking about this message, and, and they just had this covetous conversation. You know, they had a place, but it wasn't right enough. And it didn't have a screened-in porch. It had a boat, but a 25-foot boat, boat wasn't big enough. And, it went and I thought, wow, how easily we can slide off into this covetous mindset where life is stuff. Covetousness is to sin what poison ivy is to skin. It itches, you scratch it, and it spreads. You itch it, you scratch it, and it spreads. Covetousness is like that. I visited with a guy just this past week, and he had some stuff all around. The stuff he collects. I'm not going to say what kind of stuff it is, because it wouldn't be the same as your stuff. So you would say, oh, I would never do that. But you'll have other stuff. 
Because everybody's got stuff. Can we all agree we all got stuff? <laughs> but let's also agree that life is not stuff. That's the point. And I said to him, how many of these things do you have? He said, I got 83 of them. I thought, good night. Wouldn't 30 be enough? And I said, how many is enough? He said, just a few more. He said, I just love them. I just love them. And we're like that. We just surround ourselves with stuff. Did you see the memory verse in your bulletin? Do you pay any attention? It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. All that stuff. So in response to this selfish request in verse 13 and 14, and as a result of this serious warning that Jesus gives, serious language, beware, watch out of covetousness. Life's not stuff. He tells this story. Let's look at it. Verse 16 through 21. It's a story that's commonly called the rich fool, but I'm calling it rich man, poor man this morning. He spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to stow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your soul is required of you. Then who shall all those things be which you've provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. This man was a rich man, and this man was a poor man. One reason he was rich was because he was blessed by God. Look at verse uh, 16. It says, His ground brought forth plentifully. God had blessed him. He probably was like a lot of farmers. He worked hard. I've never known such thing as a lazy farmer. I don't think you could stay in farming too long if he was lazy. So he worked at it. He, he's never reprimanded for being industrious or on the job. And God blessed him plentifully. Not every farmer gets blessed plentifully, but he did. So he was rich because of that. It says, his ground brought forth plentifully or abundantly or a whole lot. <laughs> So he was a rich man because he was blessed by God. But he was a poor man because he thought the blessings came from himself. Look at verse 17 and 18 and 19. About 15 times he, he, he addresses himself. He was a committee of one. He worshipped the trinity of me, myself, and I. He didn't have God in the equation. Notice he says um, there in verse 17, He thought within himself, What shall I do? I have no room. For my fruits, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build. I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you've got much goods for many years. Take it easy. Take it easy. Don't let the sound of your own wheels drive you crazy. No, just eagles flashback. <laughs> Glenn Fry, eagles flashback. Take it easy. You got it made. It's all laid up. He never mentions God one time. So he was a poor man in the sense that he thought his success came from himself. That his blessings were self-generated. Anything wrong with ambition? Anything wrong with trying to better yourself? Anything wrong? No, not a thing in and of itself. The second reason he was a rich man was because he made wise earthly decisions. Now notice he made two decisions here, one for the present, one for the future. In verse 18, he made the present decision of building bigger barns. He just provided more storage. God had blessed him. He had to plan. He had to look into what was going on, and he managed his affairs well. We would applaud that guy. We'd say, man, that guy's got it all going on. He's a self-made man. More power to it. And then in verse 19, he made a decision that was wise about the future. He, he, said, um, he said, I've got much stuff, much goods, for many years. That was his IRA. That was his retirement plan. He felt like he had enough in the barn where he could just lay back and take it easy. And that's a wise decision to make. Is there anything wrong with having a retirement, a 401K? No, absolutely not. It's wise to do that. If you haven't done something like that, think about it. Think about starting now. 
Uh, Jesus, remember, told another parable about three guys that were given talents or sums of money. The only one he got down on was the one that didn't do anything with what he had. The other two he applauded because they increased it. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a wise earthly decision. But he was a poor man because he made foolish eternal decisions. Look at verse 20. God said, thou fool, this night. Not next week or in three days, but tonight your soul is required. Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto all once to die and then the judgment. And he kept that appointment, and so will you, someday. And the thing that made him so foolish there in verse 20 was he just forgot about forever. He thought life was now, life was stuff, this is it. He forgot about forever. He made the mistake of so many. He forgot that money can buy a house, but not a home. Money can buy a bed, but not sleep. Money can buy medicine, but not health. Money can buy sex, but not love. Money can buy advice, but not wisdom. Money can buy anything and everything here on earth, but not a thing at all in heaven. This guy was a household name. Everybody knew him. He had it all, or it seemed he had it all. But at the height of his prosperity, at the pinnacle of his success, he died. And I'm sure when news spread out in this community, both friend and foe alike paused to ponder his sudden departure. His destiny was determined by a question he asked himself in verse 17. It's the question we want to ponder this morning. He asked the question in verse 17, what will I do with what I have? He asked the right question, but he gave the wrong answer. But it's a question we all have to ask. What will I do with what I have? What will I do with what I've been given? What God gives me is His gift to me, and what I do with it is my gift back to God. He thought life was stuff. And I see a lot of people like that. Maybe you do too. Did you know in 2014, Americans spent $22 billion, with a B, Americans spent $22 billion on storage units. $22 billion building houses for our stuff. Stuff. You ever see that show Storage Wars on TV? There's stuff in there that people walked away from. Then they go bid on it, bidding on other stuff. They don't know what's behind the door at this show until they open it up. So these guys are bidding for stuff. They don't even know what's in there. But that used to be somebody's pride and joy. And then they walk away from it, and it's auctioned off. $22 billion on storage units. And you think about shows like Storage Wars and uh, American Pickers and Hoarders, Antiques Roadshow, stuff, 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 stuff. And it just fascinates me how people think life is stuff. They don't love each other. They're not patient with each other. They take advantage of each other, all in the name of stuff. 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 And talking about houses, houses for our stuff, in the last 40 years, I found this fascinating. Houses in America have almost doubled in size, square footage, but families have almost doubled in decrease in size. And so a generation ago, houses were about 1,200 square feet. Now they're almost 3,000 square feet. And a generation ago, a family used to be six or seven. Now it's two or three. Interesting, isn't it? It seems like we are becoming less and less, but we still want more and more. Jesus said in verse 15, watch out. Life's not stuff. And so the question in verse 17 is one we each have to answer at different points in our lives. What will I do with what I have? And the answer determines if I'm a rich man or a poor man, rich woman or a poor woman. Let me give you two examples from history. One is a bad example of what not to do. One is a good example of what to consider. The year was 1923. America had just won World War I that was called the war to end all wars. It wasn't, but that's what it was called at the time. 
And we were experiencing this economic revival in something called the Roaring Twenties. Happy days are here again. If you know of that time, that's what was going on. And seven men met in a hotel room in Chicago to plan the next step in America's enterprise economy uh, rising. One was the, from the cabinet of President Harding. Warren G. Harding was president when this happened. One was the director of the World Bank. One was the president of U.S. Steel at the time. The other four, I can't remember, they were big Wall Street movers and shakers. Donald Trump types, Bill Gates types, we would say today. Warren Buffett types, we would say today. And they met in Chicago, and they came up with this plan. They took it back to Washington, D.C. They got it pushed through. And the, the inaction and result of this plan led in three years to the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. It was a fatal, terrible plan. Of those seven men, two died penniless, one died in prison, one died at home after serving his prison time, and the other three committed suicide. Why? They thought they had it all figured out, but they forgot God. They were like this guy. Take it easy. You've got much laid up for many years, you fool, God said tonight. You're going to face me. Then what's going to happen to all your stuff? On the other hand, a good example from history is the life story of Alfred Nobel. In 1888, Nobel's life changed forever. He was wealthy and influential because he had invented the explosive TNT dynamite. And so he had mining companies, but he also had people begin to using it for warfare and things like that. And Nobel's brother died. And he picked up the French newspaper that morning, and what he read changed his life forever. When he opened the obituary page to read his brother's obituary, the newspaper had inadvertently printed his obituary. And he actually sat in his home and read his own obituary, what the world thought of him, how the world would remember him. And it was as the inventor of dynamite, destruction, and death. And Nobel said, it changed my life. He said, I shifted my values from success to significance. I shifted my life from earthly things to eternal things, and he endowed what we know today as the Nobel Peace Prize. And he gave millions of bazillions of dollars away to humanitarian causes. What will I do with what I have? That's the question. You say, well, I don't have much. Well, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is not the amount. The point is the attitude and the actions that follow those attitudes. Look at verse 21. Verse 21 is the point of the parable. Jesus says the only way to conquer covetousness is to be rich towards God. How do we do that? Well, let me suggest two things you may want to write down quickly. I'm almost done. <laughs> Number one, remember where your income comes from. Remember where your income comes from. He didn't. He thought he whooped it all up. You know, Job said, naked we came into the world and naked we'll leave this world. Never seen any U-Hauls behind a hearse. Never seen any pockets in caskets. Somebody said when the millionaire died, how much did he leave? He left it all. How much did the pauper leave? He left it all. We all leave it all. The man was asked the question by God, tonight you're going to be with me. Then who shall all those things be which you provided? Who's going to get it? You're going to leave it all. Me too. So remember where your income comes from. Gratitude is the doorway to generosity. When I see whatever I have, whether it be it little or be it much, when I see it as coming from God, He gave me my income. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24, 1. When I have that sort of gratitude attitude, it is the doorway, the gateway to generosity. I know the same God that gave it to me can give it back to me. This is not a prosperity sermon or anything like that. But it's the idea that He has provided for me, He has promised, and because He has, He will. So remember where your income comes from. Remember a second thing. Remember this. You will outlive your income. 
You're going to live forever. So if you've got a thousand dollars laid aside, or you've got a million dollars laid aside, you're going to live longer than that. It's not about the money. It's not about the stuff. It's about your approach to living. It's about your value system. Several years ago, I was visiting a guy. He used to attend this church. He doesn't attend this church anymore. He doesn't attend any church anymore. He's a guy that didn't take Jesus' warning, verse 15, seriously, or seriously enough. Maybe he will at some point. But I want to talk to him about coming back to church or how I could pray for him, like I do with people sometimes, try to be very gentle, very respectful. And he said, well, I don't have any excuses for you, Brother Rob. I just got out of the habit, and one of these days I might get back and all that kind of stuff. So we were talking, and he kept looking over my shoulder like something was behind me. I get kind of fidgety there. You know, he kept looking. And finally, I kind of wheeled around, and he had his laptop sitting on the, on the table there. And, and the laptop screen had a lot of graphs and and pie charts and stuff like that on it. And I kind of noticed it, and he said, oh, he said, you, you notice I've been looking at that. I said, yeah, I noticed you've been looking at that. He said, that's my retirement plan. It was back in that time when the economy was going down. The 401Ks were becoming 201Ks. Remember that? And, and he was fixated on his money. He was watching it go up and down. He, he, he told me he knew every day how much he had in his retirement. He watched it like a hawk. Nothing wrong with that unless you leave God out. That's the point here about this rich, poor man. Jesus doesn't censure him for ambition, for desiring to better himself, for building bigger storage sheds for his business. Nothing he did in an earthly perspective was wrong. We would have admired this guy. We'd welcome him into the church. We'd make him chairman of the finance committee. Treasure of the church. But Jesus called him a fool, verse 20. And Jesus didn't call too many people fools. The poem is What Shall We Do Today by Nixon Waterman. We shall do much in the years to come. But what have we done today? We should give our gold in a princely sum. But what did we give today? We shall lift the heart and dry the tear. We shall plant a hope in the place of fear. We shall speak the words of love and cheer. But what did we speak today? We shall be so kind in the afterwhile. But what have we done today? We shall bring to each lonely life a smile. But what have we brought today? We shall give to truth a grander birth to steadfast faith, a deeper worth. We shall feed the hungering souls of earth, but whom have we fed today? We shall reap such joys in the by and by, but what have we sown today? We shall build us mansions in the sky, but what have we built today? Tis sweet in the idle dreams to bask, but here and now do we do our task? Yet this is the thing our souls must ask. What have we done? today. Jesus said this was a rich man and a poor man. So think about what you have and what you will do with what you have. That'll prove if you're a rich man or a poor man. And before I close, verse 20, don't forget about this night, your soul. Are you right with God? Do you know Jesus Christ? Martin Luther King preached on this passage in 1967. The message was called, The Man Jesus Called a Fool. Martin Luther King said, Jesus called this man a fool because he let the means of his life outdistance the end of his life. He let the means of his life outdistance the end of his life. He didn't hear, he didn't heed the warning of Jesus in Luke 12, 15. Watch out for covetousness. Your life is not stuff. Father, help each one of us to learn from this parable, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Help us to be careful about this subtle sin of covetousness of seeing something somebody else has, seeing something or sensing something I think that that I need. Help us to be ever vigilant 
and always diligent about what you give to us. Help us to remember where our income comes from, that we are stewards and not owners. Help us to remember that we will outlive our income. We can never save enough. We can never put enough away. away. We can never accrue enough stuff to get us to eternity. On the other hand, Father, help us to be wise managers of what you've given to us. Help us to make wise decisions when it comes to our money, with our giving, to our purchases, with credit, with different things in life. Help us, Father, to to be people of gratitude and generosity. Help us, Lord, to not be possessed by our possessions, but to use these things for the furtherance of your kingdom. Help us to understand, Father, the, the value of things and the value of people. Help us to differentiate in this, this culture of covetousness that we live in where uh, everybody just wants a little bit more, whatever that is, and none of us can ever know for sure. Help us to conquer covetousness with contentment, trusting in you, depending on you, relying upon you, Help each one of us, Lord, to be ready for that night when our soul is required. Maybe soon, maybe distant, but it is certain that one night we will hear just as this man heard. Tonight your soul is required. Help us to be as right with you as we possibly can. Thank you for the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ, and we pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Christine, what number? 320. Let's take a hymnal and turn to 320. This will be a hymn of decision, commitment, if you stand as we sing. 320. tonight at 6. The Rices will be here in concert. For those of you that have asked, yes, Allison will be singing with them. She is in Missouri last night for a wedding. So she's on the way back. She'll be singing with them tonight. It'll be a good time to just bring some people out, enjoy some good music, good fellowship. Bring a dessert. (laughs) That's some stuff. So we'll have some stuff to stuff ourselves with, some dessert. Just a good time to be together. Hope you'll be able to come back. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your many blessings. As we know, America is the most blessed nation on planet Earth. No doubt about that. Uh, We've got so much stuff. So well off we are. And help us, God, to recognize that and to give you all the praise and the glory for the abundance that we have and to be ever mindful of the fact that the greatest thing 
The greatest gift you ever gave us was your son, the gift of eternal life. That when we do breathe our last and our names are called and we leave the stuff behind, that we have salvation through Jesus Christ, eternal, it can never be taken away. We thank you and praise you for that, Father, that our sins are forgiven, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and that you're our Father. We thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, dismiss us now. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.